Good morning, everyone. All presenter can ask to share audio and video. Thank you. For time being, we wait for the chair to enter. Thank you.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Uh, currently, uh, our uh, session chair has some uh, technical problem. Uh, I will start this session. Okay, uh, we are about to begin our uh, our uh, parallel session. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Before we start, can all of us uh, switch on uh, your mic? Uh, open your uh, open your camera and take the. Uh, we will take the photo session. We will proceed with the photo session. Okay. 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 One. Okay, one, two, three, smile. Okay. All right. Okay, first, uh, okay, I would like to seek for your all kind cooperation uh, to avoid any virtual disturbance during the live broadcast session. Does, if you have any question, uh, the conference resource personnel are ready to attend you at the uh, reception, okay, reception desk or here. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first Malaysia International Conference on Nanotechnology and Catalysis Research Center. We are now in the session Green Synthesis. And my name is Nur Azima, and I am. Uh, uh, I will replace temporarily the uh, session chair here. Uh, okay, together with me is uh, Mr. Abu Hasim as a IT moderator. Now I would like to invite the first speaker, um, Madam Nur Ain Nadia, with her presentation title. Synthesize of a silver nanodendrites with optical and thermal effects via green method. The stage is yours now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Azima. Um, please give me a minute. I would like to uh, put my slideshow. Can you all um, see? Yes. All right. Yes, you can see your side. Okay, Assalamualaikum and very good morning. Um, I'm glad to greet uh, our chair session, Madam Noor Azima, uh, invited speaker, Dr. Ruhaida Rusmin, uh, the presenter, the evaluators, the presenters and also the audience of the Green Synthesis session. So today I would like to present to you all my, my recent work which is synthesizing, uh, synthesize of silver nanodendrites with optical and thermal effect via green method. So, uh, it is well known that the size, dimension, and morphology of nanomaterials are deeply influenced by their physical and chemical properties. In this context, metallic nanomet nanoparticles are drawing high interest due to their enhanced chemical and physically properties, physical properties compared to their bulk. Among them, uh, silver has the most interesting features and has been chosen to be applied in various applications. Silver nanoparticles are well known of their optical property due to the effect of surface plasma resonance. A part of the isotropic structure of nanoparticle, silver nanoparticle, uh, various structures such as nanowires, nanotubes, nanoprism, uh, and mine nanodendrites uh, and the others have been successfully produced. Uh, recently, 
So in this work, we will focus more on silver nanodendrites. So silver nanodendrites with tree-like structure have been popular for their significantly improved optical, electrical, and catalytic performance compared to the silver nanoparticles. These unique properties are strongly due to their large surface and abundant active sites at which we can find a lot of edges, corners, and steps on the branch in silver nanodendrite structure. With increase in number of active sites and surface area, there is a significant improvement in the performance of silver nanodendrites over the silver nanoparticles. Synthesis of silver nanodendrites by green techniques were chosen in order to minimize the environmental pollution. We use non-toxic chemical in synthesizing silver nanodendrites. It's environmental friendly solvent and renewable materials. We also investigate the optical and thermal effect of silver, nano silver nanodendrites using different concentration. Okay, uh, the experimental method. So silver nanodendrites, ethanol and polyvinyl pro PVP with average molecular weight 58,000 were used as starting material. Uh, so X PVP and Y silver, silver nitrate were separately dissolved uh, in 20 and 15 ml uh, distilled water. Okay, then both solutions were mixed in um, 100 ml round bottom flask to form a homogeneous mixture using electromagnetic stirring. Uh, after that, 5 ml of ethanol was added to the above solution. And the chemical reduction process was performed by heating the sample for 2 hours at 70 degrees Celsius. Um, I prepare four, we, we prepare four sample, uh, five sample actually, 0 0.3, 1%, 10%, 15%, and 20%. Uh, we prepare the silver nano, silver nanodendrites by using the ratio, um, silver nitrate over PVP is 1 over 3. It's applied to all the sample. So for the result and discussion part, as we can see in the figure one, uh, it is an absorp absorption spectra of silver nanodendrites at different concentrations. Okay, as we can see, there are strong absorption peak appear in the visible region with maximum absorbent occurred at sample 15% with um 15% non silver nano silver nitrate okay the surface the shape of this plasmon band are almost symmetrical indicate that silver nano structure are well dispersed at the lowest concentration uh silver nit silver nitrate 1% the corresponding surface plasma resonant band is 466 nanometers, while the highest concentration uh, corresponding SPR band is 491 nanometers. These are um, the image from the TEM, which uh, strongly uh, we, which confirm the silver nanodendrites successfully synthesized. As you can see in the A part is 0.3% uh, silver nitrate is being used. So in this part, all the compound is totally uh, in silver nanoparticles. As we increase the amount of silver nitrate um, composition, 
um, then uh, the nanodendrites starting to occur. Uh, figure E, figure 2E, you can see that the, the structure of dendrites will become more dense uh, as the percentage of silver nitrate increase. Okay, this is the photoluminescent spectra for these samples. Apparently, we can be observed that strongest emission peak appear at 404 uh, nanometers for sample 15% concentration of silver. This is a good agreement with the UVV spectra where the maximum absorbent occurred in the same sample. Uh, this is probably the attribute to the direct radiative interbond recombination of the conduction sp band electron with hole and the valence band. The high PL intensity of silver nanodendrites due to their high density of edges, corners, and stack atoms existing on their dendrites. The nanodendrites with hierarchical structure have larger specific surface area to support more active sites, which can accept more photon energy and then exhibit stronger PL intensity, photoluminescent intensity. Other emission peaks appeared at lower, longer wave, wavelength. So for thermal analysis, uh, we use TGA and the TGA curves uh, for silver nanodendrites. We can observe that silver nanodendrites exhibit one step thermal degradation. The initial weight loss was calculated around 5% in the temperature range 550 to 200 degrees C caused by elimination of moisture and solvent. All the sample have the most decomposition at the temperature range 200 until 235 degrees C. We calculated the weight loss uh, is 70 to 71 percent of the sample uh, for the all the samples. So the next is DSC spectra, DSC curves. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, is Miss Nur, uh, Madam Nurain here? You can ask again, ask to share audio and video. She might be disconnected. We give her one or two, two minutes. And if not, we will proceed to second uh, presenter.
Okay, sorry for, okay, here we have Ms. Nur Ayn again. Ms. Nur Ayn, uh, can, we pro can we proceed with the Q&A? Assalamualaikum, Ms. Nur Ain. It's okay. Now uh, we proceed with the uh, second uh, presenter, which uh, Ms. Nur Fadila Shahida Ghazali with uh, her uh, presentation title, Sensory Profile of Emulian and its Correlation Between Physicochemical Properties. You will be given uh, 10 minutes, uh, uh, you will be given 15 minute presentation and five minute Q&A. The stage is yours. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You may okay. proceed. All right, Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to everyone. Uh, so for the second session, I will be presenting on sensory profile of emollient and its correlation between physical chemical properties. Uh, my name is Nor Fadila Shahida binti Ghazali and I'm from Petronas Research, Centre Merhat. So this is my presentation outline for the session. I'll start with the introduction, followed by objectives, methodology, results and discussion, and the last one would be conclusion. So for the introduction part, before I go deep into the testing of the research project, I will introduce uh, a bit a brief introduction on emollient uh, to of you. So the emollient that we use for this project can be referred to as an agent that softens and smoothens the skin. And there are also other terms used for emollients uh, to describe uh, the different functions that they have, uh, such as moisturizer, uh, and this emollient used to break the dry skin cell and maintain the skin's smoothness upon application uh, on the skin. Okay, uh, just like a base oil in Petronas Intim products, emollient is one of the key ingredients in personal care. So, for example, we as we can see uh, for this one for the one of the sample provided here. The cleansing milk product. There are various ingredients used to formulate this product, and one of it is emollient. So, based on this, um, the listed ingredient, uh, which is listed in descending order of predominance, we can see the emollient is uh, the second most used ingredient in the formulation of this uh, cleansing milk. Okay, next, emollient is one of the key ingredients uh, that has high active content, which keeps the skin smooth and hydrated in various personal care products. So we use this emollient uh, because it has a function to coat skin with thin oil film, to keep skin hydrated longer, to keep skin smooth and soft, and it will not leave any residue like other synthetic emollient. And it's also effective for soothing and healing a dry skin and also can be used to treat skin irritation. And this one is based on uh, the different function that uh, upon application of, of product that we want to formulate. And it also can be used to improve and control skin dryness symptoms. For this project, we are focusing on poly oil ester based emollient because it has been a preferred choice recently uh, for its biodegradability and possess no skin irritation for human use. Uh, for uh, based on the market, based on the current market, the current common emollient use uh, is silicon based, which are known to leave residue on skin. Uh, that's why for this study, we choose a natural based emollient. Okay, next, for this research study, the objectives are first to determine the difference between the physical chemical properties of the neat emollient and emollient formulated in water in oil topical cream emulsion, which is uh, which is the end product uh, of uh, the end product where, uh, where the emollient is applied. And the second 
objective is to establish a sensory profile for each emollient based on five different attributes. The attributes are consistency, smoothness, predability, tackiness, and absorption, either on its own or with either on its own in which when the emollient is used on its own or as a product when it is formulated into a topical cream. Next is methodology. The first one is uh, for the viscosity analysis of the neat emollient. So for this research, we research project, we have uh, seven sample of emollient. The name we call it by P1, P2, P3, C1, B1, B2, and S1. Uh, we have four different manufacturers for this emollient, which are Petronas, Croda, BRB, and Stepan. These three, Croda, BRB, and Stepan, are the widely uh, widely uh, the commonly man, the commonly available manufacturers of emollient in cost in personal care and cosmetic application and the chemical structure types of this emollient are ester and silicon based we compare these two because ester is the most preferred uh, natural based emollient due to its biodegradability and its safety for human use and we compare it to silicon because silicon is the most widely used type of uh, emollient currently in the market. So for this viscosity analysis, uh, each emollient sample was put into a clean uh, because uh, the viscosity was determined by the standard operating procedure of the viscometer use in which for this test we use a Brookfield DV3 ultrarheometer and the tests were carried out at ambient temperature. The spindle was rotated at 1 RPM values and all measurements were made in triplicate to ensure an accurate result. The next test is spreadability test. This test was prepared by measuring the spreading diameter of an amount of sample, we use 0.5 gram of sample between two horizontal glass plates after one minute of adding weight. And the millimetric graph is cut into a size of, into a size same as the glass support plate. So a circular shape was drawn uh, on the millimetric graph paper and a sample, this emulsion is the formulated sample, was placed within a circle of 2cm diameter premark over the millimetric graph paper. And then the second glass was put over the first glass, the first glass plate, and a weight of 100 gram was allowed to rest on the upper glass support plate for one minute. The increase in diameter due to the spreading, uh, once the another weight is added, was noted and recorded. And this test, was repeated in triplicate and also was repeated for an for other corresponding weight of 200 gram, 300 gram, 400 gram, and 500 gram sample. Next is the sensory analysis. So for this sensory analysis, we prepare a topical cream based on a standard formulation with seven different types of emollient. So these are the sample that we have, the neat sample that we have, and we incorporate it into this standard formulation to produce a topical cream. And we have three phases for this formulation, phase one, phase two, phase three, where we introduce our emollient in phase two as a moisturizing agent uh, for five eight percent of products. And for the sensory evaluation, the formulated products uh, were evaluated through a blind test by a respondent that we have trained and have experience in assessing emollient suitability in the final products. So for this test, the emollient were incorporated into a topical cream based on the, uh, the formulation that were listed in the previous slide. And the sensory was performed by eight specifically trained respondents aged between 30 to 50 years and a five point scoring scale was introduced with five is the maximum score and one is the minimum score for each profile. This is the profile. Uh, we have five different attributes, consist consistency, smoothness, spreadability, techiness, and absorption, where the score description is one to five, five, be five being product is easy to apply, not flowing, and one is uh, where the product is impossible to apply which means five is good, one is uh, not good uh, score. And a total of 15 sample, we mix 
uh, we have seven NEAT emollients and eight topical cream samples were evaluated. We have eight topical cream because we also formulate one blank pro one blank sample without any emollient in it. And each sample was played in an individual booth and test was performed in ambient condition to replicate actual usage of formulated products. And the results from each respondents were recorded and analyzed using analysis of variance method. So these are the topical cream that were formulated using the emollient uh, from the different from uh, the manufacturers that we obtained. Uh, this is the blank. The blank is formulated without any emollient in it. And the other seven samples were formulated with a different ingredient in the formulation. The next is for results and discussion. First one is for the viscosity of samples formulated with different types of emollient. So as we can see here, uh, the samples, uh, the formulated sample where each the sample is incorporated with emollient P1, sorry, um, P1, P2, P3, C1, B2, and B1. I hope you guys can see the uh, where my cursor is showing because I cannot use the the pointer. So P1, P2, P3, C1, B2, and B1 uh, show a significantly higher viscosity. Uh, compared to the blank sample and S1 sample. S1 sample is uh, the standard formulation co uh, incorporated with S1 emollient. And there is a slight difference between viscosity of blank uh, and S1 sample, suggesting that the incorporation of S1 emollient into the formulation of topical cream did not change the viscosity of the uh, product uh, produced. But however, the incorporation of six other emollient into the emulsion has increased the viscosity. And from it, it can be concluded that the viscosity of emollient will impact the viscosity of the high end prod product produced. The next is the spreadability of samples formulated with different types of emollient. Uh, as we can see from this graph, uh, the spreadability of emollient has increased by the increasing tested sample weight from 100 gram to uh, 500 gram, uh, meaning that when we introduce a higher higher weight uh, on the tested sample, the spreading uh, has in the spreading properties is also increased. At 100 gram of weight, there was a significant difference between blank and emulsion of B1, B2, C1, P3, and P2 respectively. And at higher weight of 500, the spreading still increased. And there was a significant difference noted between blank and the sample of S1, B1, and all samples respectively. The increase of spreading properties of the sample is probably due to the physical properties of the neat sample that is less viscous compared to the blank for the sample S1. Meanwhile, the increased viscosity of the emulsion of other emollients beside S1 suggesting that higher viscosity value has restricted the spreading ability of the sample on the glass plate, meaning that the high, the less viscous the sample, the more easily it spread on the glass plate. So these are the uh, sensory profile analysis when we analyze using the ANOVA uh, analysis method. And about analysis method, sorry. So from this, uh, from this table, we can see that the neat emollient sample performed the best. It has uh, an average value of three point nine compared to others, compared to other six samples. Oh, sorry, seven sample. And in terms of consistency, consi consistency, smoothing, spreadability, tackiness, absorption, and the average score for S1 is 3.9, higher than the others, but uh, it has only a slight difference between P1, B1, and B2. And generally, the respondents concluded that the neat emollient sample S1 had a regular consistency and homogeneous texture in which it was easy to apply on the skin, it has good smoothing effect, and little resistance to spreading, uh, in, whereby we can see here it has a score of 4.5 compared to others, meaning that it, it, the sample is less viscous compared to other sample, and had a good rate of absorption. Uh, 
and a light feel of greasiness compared to other neat emollient samples. And formulated topical cream content S1, S2 emollient was identi identified as a sample with the best sensory profile, taking into account that the average value from all rated attributes, these five different attributes. So this is a radar diagram to summarize all seven sample emollients, indicating the consist consistency, smoothing, spreading, absorption, and techiness sensory profile on a scale of one to five. Uh, this is the this, oh, sorry, the same the same slide as the previous one. Okay. So uh, next is the conclusion from this research study. The viscose we can conclude that the viscosity of the topical cream containing S one sample was similar to the blank formulation, indicating similar viscosity of the emollient used. Uh, for this project, is 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 essential that the target viscosity of a topical cream is retained so that the spreadability would not be compromised upon addition of emollient. Okay, in comparison uh, for these eight samples, Petronas emollient shows a good sensory profile and are also at par with several, several commercially available emollients in the market, in, currently in the market for uh, the five different attributes. And from the test sensory profile, a sensory profile that has been established as one sample was evaluated as the best uh, with, uh, that score high that have high scoring in every aspect of the sensory evaluation and other natural based emollient which is a poly all ester based emollient having similar performance is the p1 which could be contributed uh, by having similar low viscosity profile and sample p3 scored the lowest in sensory evaluation uh, which potentially caused by high viscosity and resulted in poor skin after fill due to the sample being uh, very high viscous. And from this research study, we also can conclude that the neat Petronas emollient uh, PE25 and PE50 showed good sensory pro properties when tested on its own. And it has a good techiness, product left no residue when applied on the skin, good rate of absorption, which is one to three minutes good consistency and smooth upon application and good spreadability and from this research from this research study also we can uh, differentiate uh, on what application we want to use our sample we have three different sample and uh, the less viscosity we differentiate our sample based on the different uh, viscosity where the less viscous sample we can use it to formulate a light texture with no oily feel uh, finished product and p100 uh, which has a very uh, which has a high viscosity we can formulate it uh, in a medium to rich texture and slightly oily feel finished products thank you okay. um, oh, thank you Okay, thank you, Miss uh, Norfadila Shahida. Okay, for your very interesting uh, presentation about the cream. Mm -hmm. okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we come to the Q&A session. Uh, you may raise your question here in the Q&A and the evaluator may uh, switch on your speaker to raise the question. Okay, there is one question from the chat box for Ms. Fadila. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your for the good sharing. I have one question to ask from Dr. Hanani Suhaimi. Mm -hmm. There are various emollients and most of them have been commercialized in the market. What is the need to conduct research and what else need to be improved in your research? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanani, for the question. Uh, to answer your question, the need to conduct the research is because our research is focusing on the emollient that that is produced based on natural plant-based feedstock. Uh, and the commercially available emollient in the market is mostly based on is mostly uh on is mostly produced from silicon. And to compare these two types of products, uh, the natural plant-based uh emollient is more has more uh, interesting value in terms of uh, the biodegradability sorry and its safety on the human uh, use and it's, it's safety for the human use and uh, this is more to relate 
uh, on the um, on the uh, we call a sustainability part. Uh, so we we conduct this research. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have I, I own uh, me myself have one question. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your actually your research gap and what is your research contribute to address the research gap? The research gap is uh, is on the sustainability part where when we when we um, when we do some literature review on the emollient production itself and also when we um, uh, when we collect data from the several different manufacturers of the emollient in personal care application and also cosmetic, uh, can we can uh, conclude that the there is there is no significant uh, production of emollient in terms and that we can relate uh, in the sustainability uh, uh, sustainability part. Uh, where the emollient can be safely um, disposed, uh, which is more related on the biodegradability part of the emollient itself, because uh, most of the emollient produced is synthetic based. Um, and sorry, uh, what is your next question? The second question? How your research contribute to your oh, uh, for this? Uh, the contrib the contribution is more on the sustainability agenda or so based on our company itself uh, to to provide to make, to contribute more on the sustainability agenda and also to the consumer so uh, they can safely use the emollient uh, especially on the skin especially uh, for the consumer that have um, that have uh, health issues on using the uh, product that has been available in the market currently Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think there's no more uh question. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Miss uh, Fadila Shahida. Thank you. Since uh we have only we only have two presenter today, I would like to re-invite uh Madam Nur Ain for the Q and A session. Okay. Uh, is there any question for Miss Madam Nur Ain? from the evaluator or the attendees, you may raise here in the chat box or uh, using the speaker. Uh, I will start first, okay? Uh, Miss, uh, Madam Norain, uh, I I saw that in your presentation, you use uh, nanodendrite silver. Uh, why you choose, uh, uh, actually the nanodendrite is considered considered as 1D or 2D or 3D nano nanostructure and why you choose this kind of uh, nanostructure? Why you choose 2D or 3D? I, I believe this is not 1D. Uh, why you choose this 2D and 3D? Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly Miss Narayan is not here. Okay, okay. She's, she's requesting again. Okay, Miss Narain. Sorry for the connection the disruption. Okay. Can you please okay. repeat again? Okay, I repeat the question. Okay. Uh, we have the question from the attendees, but I, I repeat my question again. Why you choose the, the nanodendrite silver as compared to other uh, nanostructure? Like uh, you are 2D or 3D? Why you are not using uh, 1D? What is the uh, contribution to your research? Yeah, um, we are using research uh, on silver nanodendrites because of the figure, the, the morphology. G is not 2D, it's like 3D, which contribute more surface um, area and also the active um, surface, which can be um, used for next for others. Um, application uh, which is for now we already try it for uh, enhance the surface um, uh, surface uh, surface enhance enhancer sirs raman for raman signal lah. Uh, so, uh, so for, your, for your application the the 
the uh, application is uh, for Raman, for your research application for Raman. Yeah, for now, uh, uh, we already try for Raman okay. enhanced surface enhancer. Lah. Okay, we have another two questions from the chat box. Okay, first question from Dr. Muhammad Aminul Islam. Why do you say the process is green synthesis? Uh, because um, from the literature, uh, the green method synthesizing is used um, uh, using the uh, non-harmful chemicals wow. and uh, the the synthes synthesizing techniques is um, uh, not harmful to the uh, environment. Uh, that's why I use the title we are synthesizing green method synthesizing the green method okay the third, the third question from the dr hainani sahimi madam norain silver dendrite has been extensively studied what makes your study special as compared to others and what the another question what are the current research progress in terms of different application of the silver dendrite there are two questions from dr hainani first from the chat box, uh, what made your study special as compared to others? And what is the current research progress? Uh, for these studies, uh, the difference from the other um, research has been done is by using the different approach lah, uh, for, for synthesizing this another dendrites. First, uh, secondly, we, we we uh, we try to find the optimum composition of silver silver nitrate that been used uh, which 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 percentage that will provide the best uh, the best result uh, that's number 2 and uh, for the what this the second question the current uh, research current program. research progress so um uh, so for now we have ses successfully uh, used it for surface enhanced uh, su surface enhanced raman spectroscopy um, then um, we already test it in the acidic environment so that um, hopefully we can use it for the uh, one of the drug delivery um, materials to be used in biomedical um, application. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I have another one question, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, what is uh, the mechanism that help your uh, application? How your nano material help your application? Yeah, um, because of this, the, the unique morphology of this dendritic structure, um, um, this material is more suitable on the application that uh, surface treatment which detection to enhance the detection of something so uh, we hope that the this research can um, can contribute in that kind of um, findings okay Okay, hopefully you. it's ans it, it, it answerable. It, 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 it can be. Uh, hopefully I am answering your question. Thank you, uh, Madam Norain, for your brilliant answer. Now we are moving. Uh, uh, now we are moving to our uh, invited speaker. Please welcome, uh, Dr. Ruhaida Rusmin, with uh, her research. Uh, the presentation title. Insight into structural features of magnetic kaolinite nanocomposite and its potential for methylene blue dye removal from aqueous solution. The stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madinur Azima. So, uh, actually, I'm still looking for any um, button to share my my slide. Let's have a look. Um, okay, yeah, please. All right. All right, um, can you uh, see my slide? Yes, doctor. Okay, wonderful, all right. 
Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, a very uh, good uh, morning okay, to everyone. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank everyone uh, for for this session and I would like to thank uh, the MICNC or Grandsdinka Committee for giving me uh, the opportunity to uh, share some of my uh, work in regards to the uh, clean minerals composite. Uh, my name is Ruhaida and I'm from University Technology Mara, uh, uh, UITM, uh, Negris Milan branch. And this uh, work that I uh, wish to present today is actually a part of uh, our collaboration work with the NanoCAD. Um, today, uh, I would like to talk about the uh, magnetic kaolinite nanocomposites and uh, its potential in regards to the uh, methylene blue dye removal uh, from aqueous solution. Right. Uh, so uh, perhaps maybe for, for some of the uh, participants, the terminology clay minerals maybe is quite new. Uh, so I would like to take this opportunity to give some brief uh, explanation uh, in regards to the clay minerals. So basically, um, clay minerals is actually a natural aluminosilicate uh, in which that uh, the structure will contain of uh, octahedral of alumina and also the tetahedral of uh, uh, silicates and uh, it is bonded with the oxygen atoms uh, with a specific arrangement. So this kind of arrangement will lead to uh, two major types of clays which is we have the one-to-one -one type uh, whereby okay, it consists of a one tetrahedral sheet being combined uh, with the octahedral sheet and we also have the two-to-one type uh, which uh, the octahedral sheet is being sandwiched with the tetrahedral sheet. So here uh, is uh, another um, structural features uh, for, for uh, clay minerals. So we do have different types of clay minerals. For example, uh, we have the kaolinite, we have the mica, and also we have the smectite. So each of them are having um, a specific arrangement. But uh, for our research today, uh, we are actually focusing more towards the uh, kaolinite clay minerals here. Right. Um, so why is it okay? Um, clay minerals has uh, gaining much interest uh, nowadays. Okay. So there are many factors. Okay. Mo one of the most uh, uh, I will say important factors are because of its high availability. So it is abundance in nature, and it is less toxicity and also at the high surface area. So most of the clay minerals are having a reactive functional groups uh, consisting of its alumina and also its uh, silicate and. Uh, Depending on the types of clay, so some of them will have the swelling capabilities, uh, some of them none, okay, and also due to its stability and also easy modification. So due to these characteristics, so the clay minerals has a lot of uh, applications, uh, for example, in the pharmaceutical products. Uh, if let's say um, you are uh, having a direct, for example, so uh, the doctors may prescribe you with smectite clays that will help you, okay, uh, to cover, to recover cover from uh, the diarrhea okay so we also have kaolinite okay being used uh, in cosmetics products as well uh, the clay minerals also being used uh, largely in the construction and also in manufacturing and uh, for the focus of the discussion today um, clay minerals also uh, is uh, widely used in the environmental remediation purposes so I would like to share um, some of um, our previous works in regards uh, to these clay minerals, hoping that it will give some insights to the participants about this material. So uh, previous work, we have um, actually quite a variety of uh, uh, works or uh, outputs from uh, the research on the clays. Uh, for this one, is actually we we collaborate with uh, the microbiology uh, researcher to see about uh, the uh, clay mineral and also uh, microbial interactions. Okay, uh, we also look into uh, how does this will affect in terms of the bioremediation of the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, next, also. Um, uh, previously, okay, our team are working on a type of clay, what we 
uh, of polychroscite. So a polychroscite, this is actually a, a type of clay minerals that exists uh, in abundance in Australia, uh, but it is not um, fully utilized. So our team are looking into uh, understanding the structural, uh, the electrokinetic, and also the surface properties of this uh, polychroscite. And um, for the second uh, manuscript, we what we do is um, for clay minerals, one of the simplest and also uh, easiest way uh, to enhance its surface properties or to improve the absorption properties of the clay as an absorbent uh, for environmental remediation is through the activation. So basically, there are two types of activation. We have the um, chemical approach and also uh, the uh, thermal activation. So that uh, uh, work, okay, we, we, we collect uh, some of the previous work in regards to the methods being used by the previous scholars on each uh, activation, uh, the chemical activation and thermal activation, and we make a, a review paper. And also, um, we also produce a one chapter in book uh, in regards to discussing about what are the modifications of clay minerals uh, for the environmental applications. Uh, we also uh, produce uh, or modify the clay minerals into several uh, modifications. Uh, for example, uh, we modify our clay, uh, again, uh, we use pelagroscite, in forming the uh, biopolymer uh, clay composites. Uh, in this study, we use kytosan and the pelagroscite helps to uh, improve uh, the stability of the kytosan and at the same time uh, also um, contribute to the uh, absorption performance uh, towards, in this case, uh, we used to treat uh, lead contaminated water. We also uh, has produced uh, or modified the polychroscite. So this actually uh, a diagram showing the polychroscite. So polychroscite is quite unique in terms of it is actually in the fibrous uh, form, okay, as compared to the uh, other uh, clay minerals, which are usually in the form of platelets. So um, we try to modify this pelagroscite where we embedded with uh, iron oxide to produce the uh, superparamagnetic pelagroscite uh, for the lead removal studies. So in this uh, research, what we do is we uh, characterize it and then we perform it uh, towards the lead removal. And uh, Alhamdulillah, it shows uh, quite a, a good results in terms of its removal efficiencies. Okay, uh, we also produce uh, some work and publish in the local and also the regional uh, journals. So this paper is uh, in regards to some of our preliminary work on this uh, magnetic colonic composite for the lead removal. And uh, this is about, uh, we try to compare the performance of these uh, clay minerals uh, between the raw and also those that is uh, acid activated uh, towards its uh, removal of the uh, methylene blue dye. Okay, and um, Alhamdulillah, last year as well, uh, I think we, we, we uh, we published, okay, we managed to make a collaboration between uh, some of the researchers uh, in uh, UK, in uh, Sri Lanka, Finland, and Korea to work together on the works on the clay polymer nanocomposites. And um, uh, what I want to, uh, uh, okay, so sorry. Okay, right. So uh, what I wish to uh, highlight is that uh, we believe that uh, the research on the clay minerals will contribute uh, to a uh, new scientific knowledge and there are uh, many potentials of development uh, for this material to become an environmental benign uh, nanomaterial. So moving on to our focus, uh, what we uh, produce uh, is uh, we try to work on this magnetic kaolinite. So basically, this is the kaolinite, um, the SEM image of the kaolinite. So this uh, kaolinite we retrieve from our uh, local resources. And uh, we uh, modify okay, this, this uh, kaolinite. 
okay, to form the magnetic uh, carolinite nanocomposite. So why is it such performance is needed? Uh, because uh, we try to address with the separation or the recovery issues of the spent adsorbent. So basically in, in the remediation studies, okay, for example, if let's say the adsorbent has uh, already done their, their job in remediating or adsorbent, Thing, uh, the, the contaminant of interest. So the next step will involve the separation or the recovery of the spent adsorbent. So basically the methods that being used is either sedimentation, uh, filtration and also centrifugation in which uh, the methods have some uh, disadvantages. For example, sedimentation uh, as we know is taking quite a long time uh, similarly with the filtration. And for the centrifugation, uh, although it is a uh, may okay, be achieved in a quite a short time, but we also need to think in terms of the energy consumption, the human handling, and the practicality when we want to brought this idea to the industries. So that is why uh, we try to, uh, in, in order to address this uh, issue, so we try to incorporate magnetic uh, uh, iron oxide so that our uh, spent adsorbent can be recovered uh, through the magnetic separations. So what we are do, what we are using is actually the kaolinite that we retrieve from the uh, local industries. So basically, in Malaysia, uh, we have quite abundance of uh, these uh, minerals. We uh, uh, the kaolinite is uh, greatly found in Perak, Johor, and also states like Kelantan, Pang, and uh, Sarawak, and it has a quite high value of uh, exports. And uh, basically, this material is uh, one to one tart. It is non swelling, and basically, it is in in white in color. And uh, because of its abundance, so it is a uh, very cheap, uh, uh, as uh, being uh, discussed in the previous literature as well. So basically, this is another structure of the uh, kaolinite. So. Um, the big or uh, the main idea of our research is actually we are trying to look into the nano safety of this engineered composite. So this is actually our big uh, uh, goal whereby we actually hoping that uh, with this research, we are able to produce or uh, provide some information about the nano safety of this engineered composite. Uh, because I think from the from the uh, yesterday speakers as well, they are talking about the importance of us assessing the safety of the engineered composite or engineered material that being produced. Because nowadays there are many uh, nanomaterials that being developed in the lab, but uh, little concern was given into what is actually happened to this uh, engineered composite or engineering material when you know uh, exposing to the environment uh, what is the fate what is the transformation mobility and so on so that is our main goal so in order to to get to risk uh, reach to this particular goals. So we try to start small uh, by looking into uh, the preparation and characterization of the magnetic kaolinite composite because we want to study, we want to understand what is the structure, what is the physical characteristics and so on. And in doing that, um, what we do is actually we narrow down the scope. We're looking into the influence of the different mass ratio of the kaolinite ion oxide composite. Uh, because of course in a composite, it is very important uh, for us to have a good uh, or optimized uh, composition of the uh, materials constitute the composite. We don't want the kaolinite to be um, so much higher, so that but then uh, if let's say the the kaolinite is uh, is so much higher, but the iron oxide composition is uh, very small, so perhaps the aim to have the magnetic separation may not be achieved. Uh, on the contrary, if let's say the iron oxide uh, composition is very much higher, uh, perhaps maybe okay the functionality of the composite to remove the methylene blue dye uh, may be reduced. So it is important okay, for us to having a, a, a good information about what is the suitable mass ratio so that it will affect in terms of this absorption performance, in terms of its magnetic properties, uh, and also looking into the structural uh, stability. Means that we want to see how does this kaolina and iron oxide interact to each other so that at the end of the day, hoping that uh, with this information, it will tell us something about their fates, it will help us to go further to our next uh, phase of the research in looking into its stability and also its transformation when uh, entering the environment uh, so that it will go back to our main 
aim to look into the nano safety of this uh, material. So in terms of preparation, it is very uh, simple, quite straightforward. Uh, we are a strong um, spot for the uh, 2020 Sustainable Development Goals, whereby we try to exclude uh, the excessive uses of uh, organic solvents or auxiliary chemicals. So basically, the synthesis is very simple. We just uh, involve the addition of the uh, both ferric and ferrous salts into the kaolinite and then uh, following by the precipitation by the weak place and then the material is obtained and then undergoes the filtration washing and also the drying so uh, the process is uh, basically quite straightforward and uh, we use three uh, in uh, for this uh, composites we are comparing between uh, a mass ratio okay of a one to one two to one and also a five to one of a kaolinite uh, iron oxide so uh, looking into the results, so first of all, okay, we look into the uh, magnetization uh, or the magnetic strength of this material. So basically, um, obvious, obviously, uh, if let's say we have a higher content of iron oxide, definitely uh, it will give a higher uh, magnetic strength because of the iron oxide giving the properties of the magnetism. So uh, by comparing these three composites, so... Uh, we found that uh, the magnetization is uh, pretty good. Okay, it's around 35 and pretty high, which is, um, I, uh, if we were referring to the liter literature, the recommended value of the magnetic strength uh, for a uh, magnetic absorbent to be used uh, for remediating is around 4. So basically, uh, all of our materials are, are producing quite a high uh, magnetization uh, uh, approaching to 36 uh, EMU per gram. And if you look into the uh, plot of the VSM analysis, so we can see that uh, for all the materials, so they are having a, 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 a S-like shape, okay, uh, which uh, re uh, represents uh, a near super paramagnetic uh, uh, properties for all of uh, the composites. So next, we also characterize in, in terms of the uh, structural. So uh, when we run the FTIR, so we can see that um, the uh, uh, functional uh, uh, group, okay, the bands of the functional groups, all of them are basically present. So the only difference perhaps maybe in terms of the uh, intensity. So as we can see that for those who are having uh, MKN one to one, okay, uh, so the intensity uh, for the uh, OH or also for the functional groups that from the kaolinite might be slightly differ with the MKN uh, five to one. But nevertheless, uh, uh, but uh, all the uh, uh, functional groups are uh, presence uh, in all the composites. In terms of a specific surface area, so basically the kaolinite, our malicious kaolinite is having quite a low uh, surface area. Uh, and uh, But when we modify okay, this material by incorporating the uh, iron oxide, uh, we manage to enhance its uh, surface area quite uh, almost fourfold. Uh, and uh, in terms of the uh, nitrogen absorption uh, desorption uh, analysis, so when we plot it, so we can see that all the materials are having uh, resembles each uh, kaolin and iron oxide, whereby it almost uh, uh, in a good uh, approach to the uh, type four of the IUPAC nomenclature that represents the uh, mesoporous characteristics. And um, in terms of the um, surface properties, so we run the zeta potential uh, so that uh, we can have the idea about what will be uh, the surface charge of these materials. So basically for the kaolinite, uh, our kaolinite is uh, having quite a neutral surface charge at a lower pH, but uh, it is uh, decreasing when we have a higher pH and in contrast with the um, iron oxides. So when we have a combination of the kaolinite and iron oxide, so at a different ratio, so they are having actually a variety of surface area, sorry, surface charge. So at the lower pH or at a slightly uh, uh, acidic pH, so some of them are having a positive, some of them are having a negative surface charge. So. 
um, uh, the difference in the distribution of this surface charge okay, among all of these uh, composites uh, tells us that perhaps maybe uh, the agglomeration or the position of the um, uh, iron oxide that had that uh, had uh, there in the uh, carbonate surface may not be evenly distributed. That that uh, producing a different uh, surface charge at a different pH. So when we uh, run the SEM, so the presence of iron oxide is, uh, oh sorry, the presence of Fe, okay, represent from the iron oxide is a uh, uh, confirmed by the EDX and then when we take example of the uh, MKN one to one the SEM image of the MK one to one so we can see that at the nucleation or, or the aggregation of the iron oxide okay, the distribution are actually non-even so there are some uh, uh, there are some part whereby okay the, the the iron oxide seems very dense but uh, some part for example <laughs> Uh, in the pH, uh, okay, it's, uh, it's less. Okay, so perhaps this is one of the reason. Okay, it has a different surface charge. And when we run the uh, adsorption isotherm, so basically what we see is that uh, at the lower um, concentration, okay, the all the composites are having a quite good uh, removal. They are having a hundred percent removal, and uh, it is a uh, decreasing when we have a high concentration. So when we plot the adsorption isotherm, uh, we go for the long and also the friend dish. So we can see that uh, in terms of the uh, regression coefficient, the experimental data is uh, suits well with the uh, long way uh, given by the higher uh, regression coefficient value. And we also run the kinetic. So from the data, uh, we found that uh, the kinet the experimental data fits uh, quite good with the uh, second, uh, pseudo second order as compared to the other kinetic model. And uh, in terms of post postulation of exhaustion mechanisms, so um, based on the uh, understanding on the characteristics of the functional groups available, so these are some of the uh, post exhaustion mechanism. Okay, in terms of how does the methylene blue are being removed by this material? It can be through the hydrogen bond. It can be through the ionic bond, and also perhaps maybe there are some redox reaction by the iron. Of course, uh, in order for us to uh, forecast this exhaustion mechanism, we will need uh, FTR and also, for example, XPS analysis to confirm. And this is uh, still in, in the process uh, of uh, analyzing. But what we can say is that uh, perhaps, okay, uh, the exhaustion mechanism, okay, from our available data, it shows that uh, they will be involving the external surface absorption and also a little influence on the pore diffusion. As a conclusion, so what we can uh, see is that uh, even though we have a different mass ratio okay, of uh, kaolinite and iron oxide composite, but in terms of magnetic strength, surface area and surface charge, it has uh, some differences, but it is a little influence on the adsorption capacity okay, towards the metal in blue. Uh, in terms of the advantages, so this uh, composite is easy and fast separation. We only need five minutes okay, to completely remove all, uh, almost to completely remove all the metal in blue and also in terms of the low cost of this material and the challenge relies on uh, understanding okay the next phase is to uh, understanding the stability and its transformation and also to use it for uh, treating the real uh, contaminated water okay so um yeah uh, i think uh this is all okay from my presentation and uh, i think uh, finally okay um as a take home issues, uh i would like to share what uh one of the biggest motivation for our team uh to actually pursue with this kind of research in regards to the iron iron oxide and also clay minerals uh by referring to the um uh, the holy al-quran okay surah al hadith and with uh, the surah al hadith the iron okay at the verse 25 and we send down iron wherein uh, is great military might and benefits for the people. So we believe that this research has a lot of uh, new discoveries that can be made, a new understanding and also new knowledge. So um, at the end, uh, I would like to again, uh, once again, thank you uh, everyone for the kind intention and thank you the MICNC for giving uh, a young researcher, uh, early career researcher like me to share my, my knowledge. I think they are 
setting a good example in terms of uh, giving uh, opportunity and experience to a young scholars like me okay to present in this wonderful conferences so if you have any further questions or you wish we you wish to uh, ask more okay about our research please feel free to contact me or uh, chatting through this uh, uh, conference so i think uh, that's all okay from me okay thank you okay assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and back to you uh, miss uh, madam azima Thank you very much uh, to uh, Dr. Rohaida. Okay, thank you for the very interesting and fruitful uh, presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and now we come to the Q&A session. If you have uh, any question, you can write in the chat box. Uh, and I have uh, about two questions here, doctor. Yes, please. The first, uh, what is the optimum uh, parameter uh, covers the magnetic strength, the surface area, the surface, uh, the surface charge that uh, completely uh, degrade your methylene blue? What is the best uh, parameters from this, uh, uh, from all these three parameters? Okay. Okay, thank you very much for the question, uh, Madam Nur Azima. So uh, if we compare it into uh, the magnetic properties, surface area, surface charge, so uh, we uh, found that uh, the most uh, pertinent factor that influenced the removal of uh, this uh, material uh, towards the degradation of metal blue will be the surface charge. Uh, because if you can see uh, from the surface area, for example, uh, the difference are uh, uh, actually not that uh, uh, high. I mean, the, the the difference between, for example, one from one ratio to one ratio, uh, the difference is, is not that uh, uh, high enough. Okay, but then in terms of surface charge, because we are postulating that uh, there might be a uh, electrostatic interaction between uh, the metal in blue, the cationic metal blue, with the material. So if let's say the material can uh, exist as a highly negative uh, surface charge. So it will promote more absorption of the methylene blue uh, towards the material through the electrostatic interaction. Okay. Well, thank you, Doctor. Another question from me. Uh, besides the methylene blue, what kind of pollutant that your uh, materials can degrade? Because uh, different different materials can de degrade different pollutant. So have you tried to add uh, pollutant? Okay, uh, right, thank you. So um, uh, I must say that this uh, carinite, uh, nano, magnetic carinite nanocomposite is still uh, in uh, early works, but actually we are now uh, focusing, uh, we are also uh, now focusing on different uh, dyes as well. So besides the methylene blue, so we also now trying to use for the uh, metal orange. For methylene blue is uh, the cationic dye. So we want to also test with the uh, anionic dyes as well. For example, the metal orange. And in the future, we are actually trying to expand our research on also looking into the imaging contaminants. Uh, but that will be after we really understand about this material, about its sustainability and whether this material can, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, is there any leaching for this material and so on. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, we also have a question about how you solve since uh, from your FISEM, uh, FISEM morphology. Uh, how do you solve the problem of agglomeration so that it will well disperse on top of your uh, up, on top of your color kaolinite Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, I think uh, uh, iron oxide uh, agglomeration is actually a, a, a typical problem, I might say, okay, because of its uh, high uh, energy and then its tendency to to uh, to uh, agglomerate or, uh, with each other. But what we can try to actually minimize is uh, in terms of perhaps during the synthesis. So we uh, compare between uh, without the oxygen and also with the inner oxygen, uh, sorry, inner uh, atmosphere by including the nitrogen gas. And also uh, uh, I think uh, the, uh, the, the, the another way perhaps maybe, okay, we can also uh, try to look into is there any uh, chances if let's say we can have more ratios of the kaolinite iron oxide, hoping that the kaolinite can help to uh, reduce the agglomeration of the iron oxides. Okay, so your 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 uh your sample is in powder form, doctor. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you, we can use, uh, we can reuse your powder, uh, your your powder, by using. Uh, how how did you use the the your your you reuse your um materials, because uh, the reusability. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the percentage of the reusability, and how did you collect it from the water, uh, after you degrade, after you treat the polluted water. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, because of this, its magnetic properties, so uh, the uniqueness is that uh, once, let's say, um, the material has been used for the uh, absorption or removal of the material in blue, we can just use a simple magnet to actually um, attract okay, the, the absorbent. Okay, so that, uh, and it's, it's pretty fast. So, it's around two minutes, okay, uh, almost two minutes uh, plus minus. The absorbent can be then uh, successfully attached to the external magnet. And then from that, we can separate the material. Uh, in terms of, uh, and we aim to use this approach as well in our regeneration studies, whereby uh, we, in which we are actually currently doing it, uh, we try to uh, to do the uh, gen regeneration and also the, the absorption, desorption, uh, perhaps for about two or three cycles. So, but uh, the way we do it is, is uh, currently is uh, just by a by attracting it to the external magnetic field, and then this, the material can be uh, separated, and it can be reused. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor, for your uh, brilliant answer. Okay, now, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, I would like to, uh, I am very honoured to announce the best presenter for this session, for this green synthesis session. Okay, let me sh uh, share you. The best presenter goes to Miss Nor Fadila Shahida Razali. Thank you so much and congratulations to the best presenter. Now we reach at the end of the uh, session. Thank you for your participation. On behalf of the MICNC 2021 organizing, organizing Committee, I would like to seek for your kind cooperation to fill up the feedback form. Okay, and you are invited to join the rest of the event. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Bertie. <laughs> Sorry, I have put, uh, disconnected. <laughs> Thank you.